Today's episode is about fluoride in water, the fluoridation of water. That's become a hot topic recently, as many of you may have heard that um, RFK is advising and kind of pushing for fluoride to be taken out of the water, which has a lot of people up in arms and confused and just need more information. So I did a social media live with Dr. Geraldo Magarinos, um, and I thought I would publish it here on the podcast as well. Super crazy informative. Um, a little bit about Dr. Geraldo Magarinos. He is a Chilean dentist. Um, he specialized in oral surgery, periodontics, implantology, and he was doing that for over a decade um, until he started to learn some different things. And he actually pursued his passion and became a board certified naturopathic doctor. Um, and since then has been doing biological dentistry, uh, kind of mixed with uh, integrative medicine, naturopathic medicine. Um, he's a big time specialist in the gut and we actually have a whole episode already from him on uh, the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome and the connection between the two. But yeah, he was just the perfect person to do this interview with. He's so knowledgeable about all of the history of fluoridation and do we really need to or not. And, you know, if you want some really fantastic uh, perspectives from the functional health side of things on this topic, you're about to get them. <laughs> if you want to uh, learn more from Dr. Geraldo, you can follow him on Instagram. It is just Dr. Haroldo, which is H A R O L D O. And his website is revolutiongutthealth.com. I have learned so much from him. He is a consulting naturopathic doctor from Microbiome Labs, who I do my gut stool microbiome testing through my stool test with my clients. So I've had many consults with him and I'm always just blown away by how knowledgeable he is. Um, before we get into the show, I want to remind you that uh, Paluva Shoes is currently sp sponsoring the podcast. Um, and uh, that's a rare thing, as you know, for me to have a podcast sponsor. Don't usually have them, but I wanted to introduce you guys to Paluva Shoes. Check them out. Go to paluva.com, P E L U V A, and check out the shoes. Um, you can get a 15% off discount with code Coach Tara. I've been loving them, guys. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I've been, I've been a longtime fan of barefoot shoes, um, but I have been really surprised how much I've been loving the five toe articulation, the separated toes. They're amazing. They have, you know, regular, what do you call it? Uh, the bottom, <laughs> you know, regular bottoms for the gym or whatever going around town. But then they also have some for hiking that are a little more grippy and they've both been fantastic. So um, yeah, check those out at paluva.com. Coupon code is Coach Tara. Okay, let's go ahead and get into it. Here is Dr. Haroldo Magarinos. Will you start by introducing yourself, like your professional history where, you know? Sure, yeah. Um, well, I'm a, um, uh, my background is in dentistry. I'm an I'm oral surgeon and periodontist. Um, I became a biological dentist afterwards, and that was a long time after I graduated. Uh, it took me a while to understand a few things that I, um, I'm, I'm passionate about now. And also, I, I got a degree in naturopathic medicine. I'm well-versed in the microbiome field, and I've been working and collaborating to expand the knowledge about the microbiome um, in any way I can. And of course, aligning the knowledge of the gut microbiome with the oral microbiome, was, which was one of my uh, initial uh, questions, why we get mouth diseases. That brings us to this <laughs> fluoride topic right now. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I've got like a bunch of questions and comments and I'm just stirring a real frenzy talking about this stuff. People are mad at me. They're unfollowing me. And I'm like, listen, I just want to make it clear, everybody. I'm not, and I think you'll get the vibe between and me both. Like I'm not in the, in the business of like being right and wrong. And like, you know, this weird, we just want to have a, like an adult, mature, professional conversation about perspectives. I'm respectful of other perspectives. We're not denying, or at least I'm not denying, we'll hear yours in a second, but I'm not denying that the fluoridation of water, you know, all the positive data on it, right? Um, showing like hardened enamel or preventing tooth decay. It's just, there's more to the story than just teeth when you're ingesting something into your body. And we just want to talk about all that. 
So it's please know that this is coming in a respectful manner and we welcome all of your opinions and questions. So please feel free to ask those. Okay. Now, uh, let's get right to it. Uh, do you think that we need to fluoridate our water? That's straightforward question. <laughs> the straightforward answer is no. Okay. Why not? Well, there, there's a couple of, uh, things we know, um, and we know for a long time. Um, unfortunately, uh, for some reason, and this is out of judge judgment, but the dots were not connected properly. Um, but on the fluoridation of water started in the 40s, and it was a measure for reducing the incidence of tooth decay in younger populations. And uh, there was some observational studies done at that time that they were proving that you will get a certain reduction on populations that were exposed to a certain amount of fluoride. That time was one part per million. And, and so they decided to go and fluoridate the water a couple of years after as a trial experiment. Um, uh, also acknowledging that there was no risk by doing so. Uh, in terms of human health. So uh, that was the initial part of this. On 1999, the CDC acknowledged that the utilization of fluoride in a systemic manner didn't provide any benefits. And the only benefits that could be seen uh, from all the research available was on a topical um, manner. So if you put fluoride in the water, you won't get any benefits from what you're looking for uh, from the fluoride remineralization process. So even okay. though at 1999, we, we acknowledged that from the uh, official institutions in the country, we didn't stop fluoridation of water by any means. Yeah. So a question that's been in my mind is like, you know, quickly after that fluoridation effort began, began in the water, Crest came out with fluoride, fluoride toothpaste, right? I think it was like 1954 or something like that. Yes. If everyone is using all this fluoride toothpaste, which most people are, I'd say, like, does it become necessary to have both? Is that why we keep seeing reductions and how much they're adding to the water? Or, or like, what are your thoughts on that? So the, 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 um, the evidence we have right now, because we have a comparison group, which is Europe, mm -hmm. Europe stopped, well, some countries never fluoridated water mm -hmm. for reasons we can, we can talk about later. And some others, they stopped at a certain point because of the same reasons and other concerns uh, uh, that based on, on, on evidence we have. And that comparison group, if you put it in, 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 in a side of the U.S. population, which is vastly fluorated, because we, we, there's probably no single state in the country right now that is not fluoridated in the water, according to the World Health Organization statistics, there is absolutely no difference. And at 12-year-olds of age, in between the tooth decay incidence in the fluoridated population and non-fluoridated population. So now we have a comparison group and we don't see any difference between both in terms of occurrence of tooth decay. Now, the topical application has some benefits, but the risk factors are, to my belief, they outweigh the benefits that you can get from topical fluoridation. Now, if there was any other way for improving the, improving the remineralization process of the tooth structure, then I might have a partial agreement, maybe, maybe, and this maybe, mm -hmm. in, in those uh, protocols for certain cases. But we do have better options. Yes. So not even for the very small amount of cases that that might be a good idea for improving the enamel structure of the tooth. Uh, we have other options that are much better and safer than fluoride uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of those uh, benefits. 
Yeah, this is the part because I have been, I mean, I've been on a real rabbit hole. I have been listening to other podcasts. I've been listening to mainstream media. I've been, you know, I've been reading like the anti fluoridation people all the way to like super pro. And one thing that I've noticed is that when it comes to the other risk factors that you just mentioned, like what else happens in our body as a result of ingesting fluoride or added fluoride to our water, that is not being addressed at all in terms of like the people who are like, you know, Hey, this is a good thing. It is like one of the biggest advances in human health and preventing tooth decay. Like how dare you try to take this from us? And then someone will say, well, like what else should be considered about ingesting this into our bodies? What else? And they won't besides dental fluorosis, which I'll let you talk about. There's it, it won't even be brought up. It's kind of this like poo pooed and I, I get it. It's probably because there's been a lot of like, all the way to like, they're trying to turn us into communists and like make us grow a third eyeball or actually not a third eyeball. They're trying to take away our third eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's been, you know, some kind of, I, I get it. There's been some claims that are like, okay. But I, and I think that maybe has turned off the mainstream uh, people towards it. But that's the biggest problem I'm seeing is we're not even talking about it in terms of most, you know, mainstream outlets, it won't even be looked at. So that's the main reason I wanted to have you on here is like to, to, to open up those conversations. So what are the other, you know, things that we should be thinking about in terms of ingesting added fluoride in our water for like the rest of our body? Well, uh, first and foremost, um, the delivery method, it's, it's very concerning because it doesn't discriminate uh, where uh, is, is getting at what age group the dosing is fixed for every single person of the population that is being exposed to fluoride in the water. And we know that there are certain differences in terms of tolerance within the, within a certain population uh, when they get exposed to fluoride. Some people, they need less, need, and I quote that, uh, or they might tolerate less, some people that might, might tolerate more. Some people they might have some allergies to fluoride, and and the bioaccumulation in the body because of the multi-source exposure to fluoride is another issue. We mm -hmm. we do have um, uh, options for getting fluoride if you are into fluoride and you want to use it. Uh, that will be a personal choice, but putting that in the water right. takes out the personal option of using something that might have some benefits. Now, the other problem with that is that the, the population that gets mostly exposed to this uh, are, are infants and toddlers. And in a, in a day, in a 24 hours time frame, a toddler can get as much fluoride as an adult drinking, that is drinking one liter of water. So that is a lot of fluoride for a baby in a development state. And also because we know now, and this has been acknowledged, that we don't get systemic benefits by using fluoride. What is the purpose of putting fluoride in a, in a young kid that doesn't have a dentition developed yet? There's no added benefit if we acknowledge that topical utilization of fluoride is the only effective way for using fluoride uh, for treating tooth decay. Now, the other thing is that we're talking about fluoride now as a treatment for tooth decay occurrence. Tooth decay is not a fluoride deficiency. Fluoride, fluoride it's in the best case scenario, a Band-Aid. And it, has, it comes with a price, that's the problem that it wouldn't be my concern if it doesn't come with that price. But it is not the root cause of the uh, disease we're trying to treat. So if we look at this angle, it looks like a medication incorporated in the water supply, which again, takes out, takes the rights of, of people to decide whatever they want to use something or not, uh, doesn't discriminate between age groups, and also, it's a very ineffective way from a monetary perspective because most of the water is used for other purposes, not for drinking. So even if, if, if that would be the case in terms of benefits, we're wasting 90% of the water that is being fluorated by other, using it in other ways that not 
is not being drink, and that is a concerning part as well from a monetary perspective, where we're putting our money in terms of health benefits. But the main concern is that it doesn't discriminate. Now, on the side, we have seen over time uh, multiple research done in terms of what happens if we get exposed to fluoride on a long-term basis. And then China especially did big studies on IQ development. And fluoride actually captures, um, blocks the, the enzyme that allows iodine um, to be available in the body. And that interferes with brain development. We know iodine is critical nutrient for brain development in early stages. And if you take that out of the equation, you will see a, a reduction of the IQ levels that it comes between five and 10 points in average. And that is super significant. 10 points, it's a lot uh, for a general population concern. Yeah, this is a really heated topic for sure, the, the IQ stuff. And I, I went through all of it. Uh, I have probably spent hours just like rabbit holing. I mean, I've definitely spent hours rabbit holing on this this week. And it's so interesting to see like, you know, like the Mexico IQ study was interesting because it was like, well, that was kind of like more fluoride. Like no one's denying that fluoride in high doses is dangerous. Not even the people who want water to be fluoridated. fluoridated. Um, and then the Canadian one was really interesting that showed, you know, there's been several of these that have shown like IQ drops in children's studies. Really interesting that that was like the specific thing that got studied. And on a side note, let me just say, it is concerning how little research has been done. Like, it's like, oh, you quacks don't have any evidence. And it's like, yeah, because we can't get any freaking research on any of this stuff because we don't all have just have millions of dollars to go fund studies. But there are a lot of interests, including the sugar industry. And that is not a conspiracy theory. Look into what happened in the beginning of fluoridation of water with Dr. Stare at Harvard and being funded by sugar interests and Kellogg's and all of that, like it's really interesting little rabbit hole that is not a conspiracy theory, it's just out there. Um, but anyway, um, going back to like the Canadian one, for example, like that was the most interesting one to me because they were using, they were just, this is just regular safe levels of fluoridated water. And they did show an IQ drop in children from that. But then there was this other study and it was like that study was bullshit, you know, like bogus. And it, it's just, it's kind of this interesting like war and it's very like who's right, who's wrong. It's really interesting. It's, I can understand why a lot of people are confused because it is like really, really hard to get good information. And it definitely feels like, um, like it's not even like, okay to ask a question it's not even okay to like wonder if this yeah. is a good idea. Like you're immediately like this, like idiot quack weirdo psycho, you know, like there's, it's a very weird energy that I have experienced in the last like week of just like really trying to see, okay, what, you know, cause I don't use fluoride. I filter the crap out of my water. We, I use hydroxyapatite toothpaste. Like I just figure there's better ways I can do it. Why run the risk? If there are some questions about thyroid or pineal gland or whatever, like I can just mineralize my teeth a safer way. But like as somebody who's like, I'm not like, I don't have any skin in the game. I'm not like anti-fluoride or like pro fluoride. I just want good information. It's freaking yes. hard to get it. It is. Uh, the, the thing is that we do have information, but yeah. when, when it comes to um, um, uh, supporting fluoride, um, the, uh, the, the, there was a claim that we have so much information, so many research, so many research done in terms of proving that fluoride is uh, efficient, but there's no single type A study that proves safety. Yeah, yeah. So yes, you can make correlations between uh, the occurrence of the uh, certain disease and the utilization of a certain method, in this case, fluoridation in any form and kind. But, but when it comes to safety, you need to prove that that protocol, that system okay. you're using, that therapy, is also aligning, aligned with the, the, the safety measures yeah. that, that you need to have in order to um, use something in a, in a broad spectrum way. And, and we don't we lack of those type of research until right. today. But what do we do have? Even from the early 30s, in 1930s, we, there was a lot of clinical studies and 
other types of research done in terms of concerns about fluoride and and bone fragility uh, and and also for um, uh, endocrine disruption. Th there was already a sense that fluoride was causing this because they were already looking at the the facilities that were producing um, uh, uh, fertilizers, and through the process they were spraying water and creating these fluoride byproducts that were ultimately put in the water afterwards. And that also comes with other heavy metals like arsenic, by the way, but that's on the side. That doesn't come clean as fluoride alone. It comes with other things. Mm -hmm. But they were using that for fluoridating, fluoridating the water. And we were, were seeing people in the scientific community getting concerned about this fact that we're using a waste product from another industrial process to fluoridate water. Only 10% of the country or less was using uh, sodium fluoride for, uh, for fluoridating water. All the rest was using this waste product. And, and on the 30s also, they start observing that, um, that people were getting health issues. Um, and they were using actually fluoride uh, as a treatment for um, hyperthyroidism. They knew that they can block thyroid activity by using fluoride. So it was used, but in a way that we don't even conceive right now. Right. And then all of a sudden we have this person, Dean, that uh, he published a study, an observational study that has a lot of flaws, by the way. If anyone likes epidemiology, they can look at the study. He did a 21 city study where he was evaluating the production of, of tooth decay in the population but he excluded everything that was not aligned with in, uh, uh, pushing the utilization and the benefits of fluoride in, in the U.S. population. So it was pretty biases, first and foremost. But on the other side, um, that was it. There was no safety study. It was just a correlation between, okay, we have more fluoride here and people seem to, to be less affected by tooth decay here as well, which by the way, the reduction was only by one tooth. So it was one tooth less in average that will get will not get tooth decay compared to the people that were not getting fluoride in the water. Um, okay, a couple questions coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Carrie on YouTube asked, does fluoride cause brittle bones with menopause? I could see that being a problem, but with growing children, especially poor children who don't have parents to help them with dental care? Uh, that's that's uh, one of the questions, actually. Um, and that applies to the tooth enamel as well. And, and I, I, will, I will take a couple of minutes because that's actually pretty critical. So yes, fluoride can, uh, can produce a strengthening in the uh, enamel structure and in bones in general. So it will replace a piece of the salt making the molecule of the bones and also in the enamel, actually in the enamel, we replace something called hydroxyapatite and we turn it into fluoride, fluoride apatite, which is a stronger form in the molecular structure of the enamel. But that comes with a downside. And the downside is that as a glass structure gets super hard, also becomes very fragile because there's the model of elasticity the way that it can be flexed becomes less and less um, pre prevalent. And in, in that curve, diminishing the curve of elasticity will make it more easily for that material to be, to be broken when it comes to, uh, to resist a certain strength in, in terms of forces. And if there is a force that is applied that is not in the right direction or the, the direction it's meant to be, it can easily break the structure because it became so rigid that it doesn't have any flexibility whatsoever. And that can happen in the enamel and can happen in bones as well. So they can fracture easily because of that reason. And the other thing is that the fluoride replacement, uh, the hydroxy group from the hydroxyapatite, when it gets replaced by fluoride, is not a permanent replacement. So after a while, fluoride will leave the molecule, and that leaves an empty or fragile, incomplete molecule that needs to be filled again. So you either come back with more fluoride, 
or you know better and you improve the remineralization process otherwise, which is what we're using right now. We're using hydroxyapatite and we're using vitamins to improve the capture of minerals from the tooth structure so we can improve the remineralization process without getting the assistance of fluoride, which again, it's not a very consistent, predictable way of remineralizing the tooth. Okay, thanks. Um, let me let me ask one more question. Marty on Facebook is asking, does the topical use at the dentist block iodine just like it would by being in the water? Well, the that's another great question. Um, fluoride gets absorbed through the gums. So you will get the uh, fluoride eventually on a systemic form. And yes, it has um, uh, endocrine implications because it will um, uh, lower T3, which is the most bioactive thyroid hormone, um, and, and, and also will impair the, uh, uh, the bioavailability of iodine, especially in, in, in a newborn or in, in the fetus, which we know is a critical component for the development of IQ. Actually, Asian countries, they do have a higher IQ because mothers consume more iodine-rich foods in average. Yeah. Wow. So Carl, oh no, sorry, not Carl, it's Carrie. Sorry, Carrie. <laughs> I would it's hard. It's Carl. super tiny. <laughs> My name was Carrie. <laughs> sorry. Um, she says, so in children, systemic fluoride benefit is minimal? It's not, not existent. It has not been acknowledged as a beneficial therapy by the CDC. I'm not even telling this. It's the CDC in 1999 who publicly acknowledged that fluoride used systemically, which means through the water uh, mainly, um, doesn't provide any benefits for the purpose of remineralization of the tooth structure. So um, in your professional opinion, uh, what would you recommend for parents like or adults? Like, what, what do you recommend and said? Like you mentioned hydroxyapatite toothpaste. What about the people who are going to say, well, I can't afford that because it's like 15 bucks a tube and Crest is like $3 a tube? You don't need any of those. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the problem already exists. But you have so many tools for preventing that from happening from the very beginning. And, and that comes with your decisions in the food you're going to give to your newborn from day one. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and that includes, of course, every single aspect of what we know is a healthy nutrition, clean foods, especially clean foods, diverse foods, and, and, and low, no sugar until the age of three, actually, and minimum sugar if anything after the age of three. And with that, we know that, and sugar is not the root cause by, by itself and in terms of tooth decay. It's just so inflammatory that affects the gut in such a huge way that all the nutrients you're getting for your mouth microbiome and the healthy status of your, of your mouth microbiome and your, and your teeth and every single oral structure comes from the gut. So if you affect the gut, if you're not providing nutrients uh, through your uh, digestive system, they, they won't come back to your salivary glands to feed your oral microbiome. That's actually the way you feed your oral microbiome. So everything you eat arrives in the gut and then comes back to your salivary glands and feeds your oral microbiome. If you have a starving oral microbiome because you're eating junk food or processed foods, then your oral microbiome will switch. That is the reason why we get tooth decay and gingivitis and periodontitis later down the road. Mm. It is not a fluoride deficiency or hydroxyapatite deficiency. Those are the proposed treatments for mm. counteracting mm. an already pathological process. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to wait until getting there. So speaking of the sugar thing, I just want to add a little bit more about this because this was like the craziest thing. I recommend looking into it. Like, so when right around the time, 1945, when like, uh, I think it was Grand, was it Grand Rapids, Battle Creek, somewhere mm -hmm. in Michigan, where they first flu added fluoride to the water. 
like right after that, like it started coming out that sugar was bad for, they, they listed uh, sucrose containing foods as the number one food contributor to tooth decay. And the sugar in whatever they, their committee of whatever, I forgot the name of it, but basically big sugar um, started working with this guy, Dr. Frederick Serra out of Harvard. Uh, they, they gave him millions of dollars. Did you, did you even know that the, um, he convinced the food and nutrition board for the U S in 1958 to list fluoride as essential? Yeah. Um, this guy, uh, here's some quotes. There is no convincing evidence that in the American diet, increasing the intake of sweets will lessen tooth decay. Ice cream, potato chips, cookies, and soft drinks are nutritious snacks. Coke is a good after school teenage snack. Um, yeah, this guy was like the, um, one of the biggest proponents of fluoridation of water and, um, in his own autobiography, he shared that Kellogg's wanted him $2 million to set up the nutrition foundation at Harvard. And it's just kind of like, when you start looking at that, I mean, I went kind of deep on that. The sugar, big sugar was even trying to get a vaccine made for tooth decay. Like it's, I don't mean to get all conspiracy theory on you guys, but that there, it's just out there. I would, if you're kind of like me and it's like interesting to figure out how, how these things came about, I'm just kind of pointing you in the direction of that because it, it was, it's crazy. And then another thing I'll add real quick is the upper limit is 10 milligrams a day. They say is like the upper limit of safety, but that is purely based on um, dental fluorosis. Anything yes. over like, that's the only harm they're looking at. Is that yeah. it could like mess up your teeth? Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's it, 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 it lacks of logic. Um, um, and again, um, your concern about um, us or the community that is trying to bring this into the table and and bring some better better scientific approach in terms of the um, the protocols and and the the policies we're using for mm -hmm. human health and. And I think we are all about making everyone healthier yeah. or improving human health. That, right. that, we all want the same thing. Not right. Even if you don't agree or you agree with fluoride and, right. and other types of therapies, we all agree that there, there's a vast majority of, of, of the medical professionals that are looking for better answers and getting people healthier, not sicker. I, I believe that. Maybe, maybe I'm a little bit naive, but that's no, what I totally. believe. And I, and I think that's right. I think that's true. But mm -hmm. the thing is that we are not questioning enough. And yeah. look, there's so many medications that have, have been used before. And then we later down the road, we understand that they were not good for us. And we have to take them out. There has been so many therapies and, and procedures that were used before. And we thought, oh, that's the greatest thing ever. And then we start seeing that there's some downsides and side effects and we have to take them out of the table and not use them anymore. So the questioning it brings solidity to our statements or uh, allows us to improve what we're doing in a better way. Mm -hmm. So not because we're going against a, a certain policy that comes from the government means that, that we're actually trying to go against things just because we're trying to just right a broader conversation with the current evidence right. in terms of what is better for us, what is better for our children, what is better for our communities. And another thing is that fluoride ends in the soil. Yeah. And it's terrible for the soil because it's antimicrobial. It, it, it destroys uh, the gut. Actually, there are so many reported um, uh, cases and, and research done uh, about uh, fluoride damaging the gut line. And that also is is because it turns into hydrofluoric acid when it comes in contact with the stomach. So no wonder why we have so much inflammation in the gut, mm. especially people who are using fluoride on a daily basis. They're ingesting that, even if they don't want to, there's a little bit of, of that that it will get ingested plus the water. Now you got hydrofluoric acid in, in the stomach and now that literally destroys the gut lining. And, and that is not uh, something that is in my imagination. That's something that we know is a biochemical process. We have evidence about that. And now when it ends in the soil from tap water, it destroys the, 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 the soil uh, nutrients, especially the microbiome within the soil that brings the nutrients into the plants. So now we're 
destroying the soil that brings the foods uh, to our table, even organic ones, because organic water, organic crops are not, um, uh, they don't stop being organic just because they're irrigated with tap water. Mm -hmm. And that comes with chlorine, fluoride, arsenic. Arsenic is easily bounded and aluminum as well to, uh, to fluoride. So they usually, they go, they, they make couples and they come hand by hand. That's what the other concerning part that we can bring more of other metals. Fluoride is not a metal, but it has a tremendous electronegative affinity and combine other things and bring them along with uh, as a carrier. So that is another concern that we can increase toxicity in the population by using something in the broad spectrum way like fluoride. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom is asking, I have sensitive teeth and use Sensodyne toothpaste. Is that okay too? Or is there something else to use? <laughs> Okay, well, it, it's really what you want to choose, Tom. Um, we, the um, Sensodyne was something I used for many years. I, I'm not saying all this because I, I knew this from, from, from my first day of, of practice. I, I, I was trained actually in, in, in preventative dentistry. Uh, that's the dimension I got with my degree. And we were big in fluoride. And Sensodyne and other toothpaste are... The typical one that they will use a high concentration, topically uh, um, delivered, of, of fluoride in multiple forms. The problem again is that you will get that systemically as well, and the risk factors are there. We we know about them. So the concern is, do I have a better option to desensitize my teeth right. rather than fluoride that brings less? Concerns. Let's put the that right. way, because the, the the European communities they took off, they took out sorry uh, fluoride, not not because they were sure they just were concerned. They right. thought there was no enough evidence, which is still true at this point, to prove that fluoride was safe for their overall population. So right. what they did, some countries they they add fluoride in the salt or and some other elements and they leave the choice for people to to want if they want to use fluoride or not but right. they don't force it which i believe is the best way in terms of preventive practices whenever it comes to something that we don't know really if it's safe or not right. um i i do have my posture i think that yeah. fluoride is um systemically uh damaging in multiple ways it's not something I use. I, I, I filtrate my water, as, as you do, uh, and, and, and it's something that uh, I avoid as much as possible. Um, with Sensodyne, you will get a lot of fluoride delivered on a daily basis. You, it might relieve the, um, the, the sensitivity of your teeth, but unfortunately, you will get that in your body regardless. Mm -hmm. And then with this information, it's up to you if you want to choose that option or you maybe want to use um, hydroxyapatite D3K2 combo that you can uh, remineralize your teeth in in certain few months. It's actually pretty effective, and you don't have all the other side effects. Yeah, yeah. That kind of I mean that kind of sums it up for me. Is like this kind of like war thing that's going on about like who's right and who's wrong with fluoride. Like the, that's the energy online. It's like this very like this, you know, and the main thing of the people who are very pro fluoride because of the strengthening of enamel and the decrease in tooth cake and all that, that, that stuff. Say there's no, we don't have any evidence against the ingestion of fluoride. And my question is, do, doesn't that concern you? Doesn't that concern you that there hasn't been any other research on how something that is added to all of our water that's being ingested every single day, there hasn't been any research on any other impact in the body, only on teeth. That doesn't concern you, you know? So it's like the very thing that's being used kind of in this like aggro way. I'm like, wait a minute though. Like, aren't you curious? Aren't you that's, that's just my question is like, I'm curious, you know, I'm curious how something that I'm going to be intaking in my body every day is impacting it for sure. You know, and some things I'm not that worried about, right. I don't, I'm, 
I don't walk around with a mask every day. I know I'm breathing in viruses and fungi and all sorts of crazy stuff every day, you know, <laughs> but something that's like man added without real actual safety research. Yeah. That stuff starts to concern me because we don't know how the body works completely. And I, they, we definitely didn't know in 1945 when this all started, it, I mean, like, did we even know what macros were in 1945? Like, you know what I mean? Think of like the nutrition knowledge in 1945 was pretty bare bones, you know? Yeah. So we're going off that era. Uh, <laughs> it, it's just the, um, well, I, I, again, the, I think that some countries, they chose not to because of that concern. Right. Um, but if we think about the most obvious um, result of the uh, overexposure to uh, fluoride, uh, which is fluorosis, mm -hmm. that is still being debated. But we know that there's some um, enzymes and proteins that are uh, dysregulated, and that affects the way that the enamel structure is being built. Mm -hmm. And that's through the action of fluoride, and that's what it makes the uh, pits and 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 the uh, discoloration and the abnormal optic structure of the enamel at the end of the day, which makes it more fragile. Which is a contradiction because it should be stronger, and we get a more fragile uh, enamel. Well, that is because beyond a certain point, that fluoride becomes so strong in the activity that blocks these proteins that are needed for normal processes of repairing and, 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 and build up of structures that are needed in the body. So again, this is, this is obvious that you can see it. You, you can't deny that something went south mm -hmm. when somebody got exposed to fluoride in higher amounts or for too long, whatever is the case. Um, so uh, there's some really clear observational data that brings the question into the table. Well, if this happens in our protein system and everything else, what else? Right. What else can happen? Right. That is my concern, that right. we're not bringing this out of a hypothesis that things may or not occur inside our body's pathway. No, this is something that anatomically you can see in, 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 in children. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right well i think that pretty much sums it up i feel bad my instagram didn't connect so that's a bummer but we got youtube and facebook here let's see or maybe they're yours no they're mine okay. hopefully yours are on here too does fluoride help to clean the water i think i learned that it lessens the amount of chlorine in the water uh um not to my knowledge uh i don't have any evidence of that it is antimicrobial but i don't think it is antimicrobial enough to be um, uh, a water cleanser <laughs> agent. So that my answer is no. All right. So moral of the story here is get your gut healthy. <laughs> so you have a healthy oral microbiome. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you can always use hydroxyapatite if you want to boost the mineralization of your tea. And anything I'm forgetting? <laughs> no. By the way, from, from hydroxyapatite, there's two forms. The, yeah, I, want, I actually did want to ask you about that. They're non-nano and nano forms. Uh -huh. So nano particles are more easily uh, incorporated inside the cells. So uh, I have some concerns about nano hydroxyapatite. They're okay. still the, being debated, but okay. we don't know yet. So okay. hydroxyapatite, uh, I'm not concerned really. It's a uh, it's a natural occurring molecule. It's uh, biocompatible, uh, and 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 I and we know that works in the way that is intended. With nano, can have a more potent effect, but just don't use it on a regular basis for too long. I think that the time frame should be not more than three months, and then you need to transition to a non-nano hydroxyapatite toothpaste if you want to transition. Okay. Uh, hydroxyapatite uh, toothpaste at all it might not be needed but also important your tooth structure grafts minerals through um, mm -hmm. a, a force that is created inside the tooth so you have a certain spinning force 
that is grabbing minerals, and that's actually something we know uh, is, is quite recent. And it's those uh, movements are controlled by vitamins. And the two key vitamins for that are vitamin D3 and vitamin K2. So whenever you get a proper nutrition and you get those vitamins in your foods, then you can grab minerals from your foods as well and remineralize the tooth structure, even without any further assistance. So cool. keep that in mind that nutrition is your best healing tool for anything, including teeth. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Hopefully that will I'm sure that I think it was valuable. I, it was super informative. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Thank you guys. My pleasure. With us. All right. Bye. Bye.